Uh, thanks, Carl, Tom, and for everyone here for coming back after lunch. You know, Daniel Pink, he's written a number of books on engagement and motivation, and his most recent one was called The Scientific Secrets of Timing. And one of the takeaways from that book is that we all are hitting a cognitive low right about now. So what uh, you know, Carl and Tom were really asking me to do is keep you awake long enough so we could get to the better speakers that are coming after me. So just setting expectations here. Now, they also changed the pointer, so, oh, I got it right. So many years ago, when I started my journey in the area of strategic development, execution practice, I was in that proverbial boardroom that you probably all know. We are about two years into a pretty major strategic initiative, and we were there reviewing the results. And as I was reflecting back on what we were trying to tell our board, we went through the normal checklist of things. We had brought together the best team. We had hired a tier one consulting firm that came in, did industry benchmarking. We had done massive customer focus groups and studies to really get insights into unmet needs. We had done an exhaustive six-month competitive analysis of everybody else in our industry. Once we'd gotten buy-in to the plan, then we assembled the team. We had executive sponsorship from the CEO down. Everything was in place for that strategy to be successful. And here we were, 24 months out, looking at the results. And as you can sort of see from the picture I chose for this slide, we weren't exactly celebrating. And it was about that time that through, you know, everybody was trying to rationalize and explain what had happened, that our CEO stepped in and said, come on, people, this isn't rocket science. And as Carl graciously, I was sitting there going, I think I'm the only rocket scientist in the room. I don't get what he means. <laughs> and so, you know, that kind of, like I said, that was about 30 years ago. And so I've never forgotten that one. And I've made it a passion of mine, independent of helping run businesses, but really understanding the practice of doing strategy, you know, really strategy as a profession. And so over the years, when I think about teams I've been involved with, companies that I've had the pleasure of working with, I've always looked at the results and thought, are my results typical? And so as Carl mentioned, that's why we got into this subject about actually, for the people that are going to be here, let's understand what is a typical result. What do people think of strategy development and execution? What's the rest of the world experiencing? And so along with a virtual team that I work with in this area of sort of call it more research on the practice of strategy, we put this survey together. And I want to thank, it was a rather lengthy survey for those of you that do this kind of work. Um, I want to thank everybody who participated. It actually took a little bit of sit down time. I know a number of people in this room did it. And so we wanted to share some of those insights with you. Now, we got, it was mentioned, over 300 qualified responses. And qualified means here you actually do the work to go through and they aren't just checking the boxes down the middle all the way. You actually have responses that were thoughtful. You can look at the times. Um, we had diverse industry coverage. Using the SIC codes, we got representation from just about every industry, plus nonprofits and government organizations. And then in terms of representing companies and organizations of different scale and size, we had everything from, I said, nonprofits, one to two million dollar companies, to several five billion plus type conglomerates. So I thought we had a pretty good spread in terms of that representation. And half the respondents spend at least 20% of their time in their job actually doing strategy. So people who actually know what's going on in their companies. And so the first piece of feedback in terms of responses that we got was interesting. So 78% of the respondents felt confident about their team's ability to develop and execute strategy. And that number surprised me because in my experience, I don't know that I would feel that confident. So then I was like, okay, maybe I'm just really bad at this and I look back over those stories I was telling you. So I went out and did some literature searching in terms of what is the nominal success rate of strategic initiatives. And the best one I found, again, looking to the methodology and the rigor of doing this kind of work, was a study, a joint study between the Economist Intelligence Unit and the Project Management Institute in 2014 that surveyed 3,500 strategic initiatives, again, companies of all different sizes, and their net result was 44% of all strategic initiatives fail. And so I was just thinking through the dissonance there of we start really confident what we're doing, and yet the data actually shows we're not that good at this thing we call strategy. 
So we broke that down a little bit more through the survey to actually think about where is it? Is there any insight into where things go off the rails? And so we looked at people's satisfaction with their ability to actually develop strategies. These are people who think they want to get better. So 39% of the responding population really felt the need to improve how they do strategy. About 32% said they have to get much better at executing strategy. 29% felt that they were satisfied and wanted to get better at actually evolving their company. So this has to do with the, say, cultural aspects, organizational aspects, but only 29% were actually satisfied with where they are and really felt they had to do better. And then when we looked at the question of things that happen in your marketplace, you know, competitive responses, changes in customer profiles, only 23% felt confident and satisfied with their ability to react to what happens around them. So there seemed to be lots of room for improvement. Now, I mentioned that strategy is a passion of mine, and Carl and I did meet in Austin and spent a little bit of time. We were joking, Austin also thinks, for those of you that know Portland a little bit, I'm going to put in a pitch for Austin. There's a bumper sticker. You might see it on the cars here. Keep Portland weird. Well, actually, there's a bumper sticker in Austin that says, keep Austin weird. And we were trading scotches over who actually got to that bumper sticker first. I think the Austinites claim it now. But I lived in Portland for a quarter century, and because of my corporate experience, um, I had the great pleasure of lecturing. About a 12-minute walk south of here is Portland State University. And so I had the pleasure of guest lecturing in their master's programs, typically for their strategy courses. And that's always a lot of fun, because when you're looking at mostly people early in their careers, they're doing an MBA or a master's in engineering management, and they're in their strategy course. I mean, this is the pinnacle of their master's degree. I mean, everybody wants to be known as a strategic thinker. Everybody wants to be part of that strategy team. Everybody wants to be associated with that strategic initiative that's going to result in success and grow their company. So people really, really want to be in this class. And so when I get up in front of it, and there's all those eyes, a little bit like we are right now, staring at you and listening for what are you going to say, I actually start with a little story that goes, OK, I'm going to simplify this whole process for you. And I say, strategy is nothing more than a full contact sport. It's all about winning. And the trophy is this tiny little thing we call budget. And at that point in time, you can just see the oxygen disappear from the room. And they're sort of puzzling, like, I thought I was supposed to get some really interesting things here. And, and I unpack that for them a little bit. And I said, no, you have to think about it. Doing strategy in a corporate environment is different. Because every other part of your day, you're going to hear phrases like collaboration. You're going to hear talk about how we have to work together as a team, and how we have to leverage our skills. But especially in larger companies, strategy is the one time when it's my business unit, or my project group, or my operating company, and I'm pitching for that little tiny bit of incremental OPEX and CAPEX to be put into my team and my people because I think we can grow faster than those guys over there. So for the rest of the time, you know, usually strats are once a year process. For the rest of the time, we're all collegial and collaborative. But when you're actually doing strategy, it's really, really competitive. And so that gives them a slightly different perspective on what it is that they're getting into. Now, because, of, and I've been using that metaphor for years, and as I work with a virtual team of strategy researchers trying to do this, and so we've actually had that conversation. You know, we use this metaphor all the time. I mean, even oh, Anthony and the earlier speakers, you were talking a little bit about sports. And, and I thought about it, it's like, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good metaphor for the most part of the time. And um, we like to use it. I mean, there's books that are written, playing to win, you know, rules of the game. There's, there's no shortage of things you can read that speak and are built around this metaphor of sports and strategy. And so we started then talking amongst ourselves and saying, well, how good is it? And certainly, you know, I started with it's all about winning. And certainly the parallel there is very good. I mean, sports is all about, you know, winning the championship. And in business, we talk about being number one or number two in our market. We talk about gaining share, winning over our competitors. So certainly that piece works. And then, well, we certainly talk about talent, right? We gotta, there's a war for talent. We've got to have the best players on our team. And so whether it's a sports environment or a corporate one, that seems to fit. Now, once we've got all that talent, 
and you've, you're assembling the team, you can't leave it to itself. You need to have great leaders. You need to have great coaches. You need to have people that are guiding, that are setting the bar, setting expectations, and driving your team to that goal. And then, of course, everything I've said to this point in time, I've probably repeated the word team a dozen times. And nobody actually uses a metaphor like, our company is going to be like that downhill skier. I mean, it just doesn't work. Individual sports is not the metaphor that you use in a corporate environment. You always want to talk about the team environment. And then certainly, playbooks, right? You've got to have your go-to-market playbook. I'm in corp dev. We've got to have our M&A playbook. I mean, everybody talks about these playbooks that you use to develop and execute your strategy. And again, lots of literature written on that. So it would seem, after spending all that time thinking, that maybe sports is a really good metaphor that we can use train, to train people how to, th how to think strategically and how to do this in a corporate environment, with one minor exception. And so if you actually look at all the sports, just using the one that I had up there, baseball, well, there's this thing we call batting practice. And there's this other thing we call pitching practice. And there's this final thing we call fielding practice. And if you actually go and study the time in all professional sports, between 80 and 90% of all the time is spent practicing. There's very, very little time actually spent in the game environment or in the championship environment. And that difference, when you get to hone your skills in a non-threatening, supportive practice environment, and it's only occasionally that you actually have to go out in full competition mode, is where the metaphor is perhaps imperfect. Because how many of you get to practice your three-year strategic initiative four or five times before you have to go to the CEO and say, we're ready? You usually get to pitch it, and one or two quarters later, you're already measuring it. There is no practice. And so the metaphor that we've been talking about, and with, like I said, team of colleagues that I stay associated with, is that actually strategy is maybe a whole lot more like rocket science. And think about the first time the, this country, the United States, was trying to reach the moon. So you only had one chance. I mean, there wasn't going to be multiple attempts. There was only going to be one country that was going to be first to the moon. And getting there the second time and the third time really didn't matter. So, you know, not winning in 2018, but being the 2019 champions, like the Blazers are going to be, great. But, you know, you don't get the same thing. Now, there is no practice. And, and I think that's probably the most critical thing about how to understand what you're actually doing when you develop and execute strategies. And then, it was mentioned a couple of times this morning, the really biggest change between the sports metaphor and what we're referring to as rocket scientists is the degree of uncertainties. If you have some idea, you can study what's going on, you can practice it, you can develop a pretty good strategy and a pretty good execution plan. But when you think of those teams of people that had to be the first ones to the moon, they had no idea what they were going to face. And we sometimes use the word risk and you can do risk mitigation, but there's a significant difference between risk, which is you can expect something to happen and it's probability, and uncertainty, which is I just don't have a clue. And how am I supposed to put a strategy in place when I don't have a clue what my customers are going to do? I don't have a clue what my competitors are going to do. And it's built around a bunch of assumptions. And in fact, one of my favorite stories when I'm you know, talking with my teams about strategy is they always come up and, you know, we can paraphrase it. It's like, well, two years from now, when we develop this really great product and launch it with our sales team, we're going to win all kinds of market share. And I said, well, that's great. And I said, why is that? Well, because we're so much better than the competition. I said, yeah, but there's an assumption in that. I said, what's that? Well, you're comparing our product two years from now to what you just benchmarked today. So what's the competitor going to do over the next two years? And they're like, I don't know. Okay, so two years from now, why are you so confident that that strategy is going to work when you have no clue what the competitor is going to do? And then you start saying, okay, well, what do you want me to do? Well, there's things you can do, and we'll talk about them a little bit. And then finally, and I want to touch on, I think we're ending a new world, and there's going to be some speakers later this afternoon that will also talk about some of these trends, but we're getting to a point, and the first shot to the moon was actually the first instance in which computers and algorithms were used to assist humans in making decisions. It's pretty clear, if you go back through the history, 
that that first successful launch and landing on the moon could not have happened if computer technology had not already been there. The calculations that were needed, the scenario planning, the uncertainties cannot be handled by humans. Um, one of the virtual team that I work with is a cognitive neuroscientist. And, you know, he's shared with me, and I've really internalized it, the human brain can actually only hold six independent thoughts in your head at any one time. Six. So when you think about, you know, all the things I'm supposed to be thinking about and contemplating, you get to six. And then the next one you put in there knocks another one out. So we as humans are actually really poor at making complex decisions. Oh, by the way, the failure rate for the rocket science, 44% of corporate strategic initiatives fail. In the history of rocket launches, the failure rate's only 6%. So maybe these guys are onto something. Now, where I want to take us next is this whole question of complexity. And you know, are we, you know, this is something you hear all the time, and I think back to that early CEO, we were talking about, well, you don't understand how complex things are right now. And I was thinking, well, that was 30 years ago when we were telling people, you don't understand how complex things are. And so I was thinking, well, I've heard that 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. I'm using it right now. Next week, we've got a strategy session at my company. I've got a couple of teams that are going to be using it. And, and I saw this quote, and I'll just read it. You know, the modern world has overwhelmed people with data, and that this overabundance is both confusing and harmful. And that sounded like a really, really telling quote. And then I figured out who actually said it. It was written by Professor Conrad Gesner about 1540. <laughs> and it was in response to, of all things, the invention of the printing press and the proliferation of printed books. And his thesis was, we're now flooding the human race with so much information they can't deal with it. And so he was the, actually, he was the inventor of what we would now refer to as the bibliography. So he tried to codify all the books and all the knowledge that was being printed to help people even understand what was out there. So this whole question of complexity seems to be something that we as a human race are pretty good with figuring out. I mean, like I said, go back in 1540, thinking about indexing books, that that was the most complex thing people had to do. Yeah, not going to stop us today. So, but it is something that's on the minds of at least all the survey respondents. So 74% of everyone who completed the survey said that dealing with the complexity in their business environment, and remember, this is now across industries, nonprofits, governments, across revenue ranges, across the board, dealing with complexity was the number one thing we heard about in terms of challenges with strategic thinking and execution. Now, at the same time, we as humans are actually really good with dealing complexity. And the reason for it is we've figured out how to do a couple of different things. So you have to break complexity down in some different ways. And the first way that you get to it, it's a question of are you dealing with scale? And what I mean by scale is, can you take whatever problem, whatever initiative, whatever you're trying to deal with, and break it down to a constituent part? And if you can, you can usually manage it at that level. And then if it's just scale, once you've figured out how to do something small once really well, you can then do it multiple times. And so you see this in the business world all the time. People put processes in place. I have my product development process. I have my go-to-market process. I figured out how to sell to one customer. I can figure out how to scale, sell to 1,000. I can figure out how to sell to a million. Well, the next element of that is diversity. So that was the next type of complexity that humans have had to deal with. Now selling to one customer and 1,000 customers when half of them are in Asia and speak a different language maybe isn't as easy as to selling the one to the guy down the street. But again, diversity we've addressed by breaking it up into parts and recognizing, hey, we need a different playbook for the different component parts, but we can still figure out how to put those together. The one we really don't do well with is interdependency. And so this is the one where a tiny change in my supply chain in Asia is going to affect my customer needs in Europe, which is going to influence my financing in the United States. And that is, of all the elements that humans struggle with, it's interdependency. And it goes back to that six things. 
So once I've got seven things that are dependent on each other, I stop being able to deal with it. And so we have, as a race, been particularly good at bringing in tools. And so this is where we hear about strategic planning tools. We hear about frameworks. And so the problem is today, when we look at the complexity, more and more people are saying the tools that are out there. We saw that proliferation of strategy development frameworks that was on the slides before. Um, and I've seen that. There's a, a Boston Consulting has a book that your strategy needs a strategy, and they highlight it. There's something like 580 independently developed frameworks for doing strategy. And they're all meant to address some combination of scale and diversity. They don't actually deal with the interdependencies. So that's what's new. Breaking that down a little bit more, we actually looked at where there was complexity and was complexity in a particular part. So thinking developing, executing, evolving your culture, and then reacting to the market around you. Was there some unique place that that complexity was finding itself more than others? And again, what we heard in the survey was that complexity is now being found in every phase of the strategy development and execution workflow. People are seeing that everywhere and are struggling to deal with it. So, so going forward, a little bit of future thinking then. We've really spent a little bit of time thinking complexity. We've dealt with the tools before. Maybe we're good for another 30 years because we can just keep applying the same approach of coming up with some good tools, some good frameworks, and it'll take us into the next decade. Except for if you really look at it and think about just from the lens of interdependency, is our world truly hitting a new inflection point? And so if you think from an economic point of view, and the little picture I've got there, global supply chains, global interconnected economic systems, the tiniest little change, maybe a trade war here or there, doesn't affect two companies, it affects the globe. You've got, and we've talked about it this morning and you hear about it, the amount of data that's coming in today. You know, server centers, um, social media platforms, the ability for our businesses to generate data, which we don't actually have the same capacity to analyze, is far outstripping what we're thinking about. So you probably heard about 5G, 5G networks. Certainly it's supposed to make our cell phones faster, but this is also going to introduce new levels of connectivity between machines and humans. Um, it's associated with autonomous driving, so our cars are going to become robots. Our robots are going to interconnect with other robots. They're actually going to leave us out of the picture and do a lot of the decision making behind the scenes for us. And then certainly we've got no shortage of emphasis today on machine learning and algorithms and artificial intelligence. And one of the most interesting things from that is I'm actually today in an industry who gets asked with the question, how do we test whether an artificial intelligence algorithm is working or not. I know how to test whether or not the car I just produced is going to work. I even know how to test some of those rocket components and see if they're going to fail. But we don't actually know how to test an AI algorithm. We haven't figured that out. We just trust them. We just trust them to do things. And then we've got technologies that, even for rocket scientists, am I supposed to be looking at Blockchain and Bitcoin is something that helps me, or am I supposed to be scared of it? I mean, people don't even know what to think about these days. So, you know, again, we looked at the survey in some different ways, and the number one thing that people were asking for is, help us reduce the effort, reduce the amount of time, reduce the amount of investment I make in dealing with complexity. And over the years, um, and this will be a little provocative to the room, the phrase I hear over and over again is keep it simple. Get to that one or two, you know, what's the essence? What's the key insight? Make it simple. Get to that one or two things that everybody can understand and deal with it. And the answer is absolutely not. You're going to a new place in the world in terms of the volume of complexity and even the thought that you might be able to simplify it to the point that you can make a decision is flawed. And I'll give you an example. We've done uh, work with a company. They had a really successful strategy, 20 years of double-digit growth taking market share, just a standout in their industry. And then over the last several years, that strategy really didn't seem to be as effective as it was historically. They looked at it. They had this typical boardroom arguments. Hey, is it an execution issue? Is it a leadership issue? 
is it a strategy issue? If it's a strategy issue, what is it? Is it our sales strategy isn't working? Is it something about our product strategy? Well, we actually came back and with some proprietary tools, and we did a computational analysis. And what we ended up identifying was that their strategy actually comprised about 100 strategic elements, all of which were distributed and were contributing like a point or 200 basis points of growth, so that what they saw as one strategy was actually the coherent working of a 100 component strategy that they had developed over the years. And what they didn't realize was that over two decades, about two thirds of those elements stopped working. But because you were only measuring one thing, because you were just focusing on one thing, you had no way of actually seeing what had happened. And all you could tell was, weren't hitting the revenue, weren't hitting the profit goals, and a lot of really frustrated people. And so we've been spending a lot of time looking at how do we apply these computational techniques, both to the development, analysis, and then tracking the performance of strategies going forward. Now, and this was referred to a little earlier as well, this isn't actually a new practice. So in the financial trading industry, if you go back about 25, 30 years, and whether it was the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange, financial decisions were made by very experienced people with a lot of intuition in real time on a floor. I mean, that's, that's the way billions and trillions of dollars and decisions were made in real time. Now, I have a colleague who also studied under a Nobel laureate and has been in that market for years, and he worked in a very unique environment. You know, very, it's like about 10 people get to do this. He worked in the bond trading, the global bond trading floor. It's actually in Tokyo, of all places, to offset on times. And the way he used to describe it, at the end of any one trading day, he could point to the person in the room that actually moved the bond market. So whether it was up or down, you could actually point to she did it, except for when I asked him about that, you know, how do you train someone to have that much responsibility? He laughed. He says, what do you mean train someone? He said, there isn't anybody in that room making a decision. Every single decision for bond markets today is made with an algorithm. They have humans check them once in a while, but that team of people and what he was, he was a computational scientist, and all they were doing was developing these algorithms to do human decision support. And that's how all the bond markets move today. Now, one can say, hey, that's the financial markets. We're talking about billions and trillions of dollars. That makes sense. But two things have changed that. One, it used to be the financial industry because you had a wealth of data. And the other reason it used to be the financial industry is because they were the only ones who could afford computing costs. So at the time, my colleague was trading bonds in Tokyo, the computers they were buying to do that were about 100,000 each, and they had a floor of them. That same computational power, you know, you probably all heard of Moore's Law, but translating Moore's Law, what it means in this scenario, is a computer that in the late 90s was costing over $100,000 is currently costing about $10 and is sitting in the A10 chip that most of us have on our iPhones. And we're not stopping there. I mean, that's going. Um, I have one of my colleagues here that helped me with the research. We had an opportunity to see the early version of IBM's Watson computer, the one that won the Jeopardy challenge. Now, discounting, they've had a lot of public press lately about some of the failures of that system. There's a whole different reason they're struggling in healthcare. But to put that one in context, when we saw Watson, it was also a computer that was probably the size of half of this room that we're sitting in. They expect that to be on a laptop in 2021. So what one Jeopardy in 2010 will be on a laptop in 2021. Oh, and by the way, they made it really tough because the Watson computer wasn't allowed to be connected to the internet. So it got to get its data once, and then it had to do everything inside. The other thing that might surprise you, and I ask this question a lot of times, you know, that sounds like a lot of work. We're talking about IBM. We're talking about millions of dollars big computers, how many people did it take to develop the algorithm that beat the best human at Jeopardy? Anybody want to guess for the software? People that do software in this room, we typically talk about man years of software development. Any, anybody want to shout one out? I need somebody too. 
300. I like the 300 number. So let me put a, a, a typical one. So a normal software, where, where's Carl? How many, how many people do you have total? Eight, nine. So the Watson team was 12 man years. Six guys, two years. Built the algorithm, not the computers, but six man years, or 12 man years, six guys, two years to build an algorithm that beat the best human at what we think of as a very human endeavor. And that was in 2010. And so you have to take that, the combination of the reduction in the cost of computing, the ease of developing these algorithms, and then the onset of things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. These are all tools and techniques that are making doing this kind of strategy analysis and measurement much easier going forward. And so I'll offer that going forward, and Mark this morning talked about that unique company that had the board seat that was dedicated to an algorithm, and I, I really liked it, it resonated with me, I'll offer again, because of the cost of computing, that going forward, not only will there be the board seat with the algorithm, but that every one of your strategy teams had better have a teammate that looks something like this. <laughs> because if you don't, you're gonna be limited by your six independent thoughts you can hold in your brain compared to what someone like that can do. And so, just in closing then, and you know, setting up what I think is the future of strategy development and execution, if you wanna be at that two-year review in a few years from now, smiling at the success you've had, it's probably got more to do with the algorithms and the software tools you've adopted than any amount of the traditional techniques that we've all used for decades. So with that, I think I'm good.